Uh, we're going to go right into our keynote. It's, it's a real pleasure uh, for me to introduce Jeffrey L. Cannon, who is the section chief of the FBI's uh, Terrorist Financing Operations Section, uh, which we all know affectionately as TFOS, I think, uh, and the Counterterrorism Division, too. TFOS leads U.S. law enforcement and, and intelligence communities' efforts uh, to identify uh, and defeat terrorists using financial investigative techniques that exploit financial intelligence. Since 1999, uh, Mr. Cannon has worked on the counterterrorism matters at FBI headquarters in D.C. as well as in Athens, uh, Greece, and along the U.S. and Mexican border in Arizona and California. Early in his career, uh, Mr. Cannon investigated organized crime, drug trafficking, and violent crime matters in Arizona. He is an accountant by training with a bachelor's degree in that field, and he had, has done a stint at Ernst & Young in Philadelphia uh, prior to joining the FBI. Many of you know him because of the tremendous outreach work that he and his team do uh, with your financial institutions, and it is my pleasure to have him here. Join me in welcoming Jeffrey L. Cannon. Thanks very much, Kieran, and thanks very much for the music as well. Pretty neat intro for an accountant uh, turned law enforcement. Um, so uh, it's true, the lights do help shrink the room, uh, thankfully, but it's really my pleasure to be here at another ACAMS event. Um, I've attended uh, events in Washington, D.C. where it may have just been the size of maybe like the first three rows here and then also out in Virginia um, at, a, at a much larger event and also in Cary, North Carolina. Um, it's my pleasure to represent the FBI Counterterrorism Division and on behalf of the Assistant Director Michael McGarity, I'm here to speak specifically about how the Terrorist Financing Operations Section um, adds an effort across 12 sections within the Counterterrorism uh, Division and also throughout the U.S. intelligence community um, as well by providing force multiplying financial investigative techniques um, which have proven themselves since the emergence of TFAS following 9-11. Um, my purpose for coming here today is to give you sort of a, a state of like who is TFAS, what distinguishes TFAS from the Criminal Investigative Division's Financial Crime Section, TFOS's methodologies of, of conducting financial investigations and also what we call financial targeting, uh, financial network targeting. Give you an idea of what the current threat is, which I'm, I'm sure that you're all following what the current threat is, but as we mentioned resources right before I took the podium here, we all have finite resources and we need to apply those resources judiciously across the limited number of people and, and funds that we have. So what we try to do in, in TFOS, we do across the FBI, is actually provide the most support to the empirically the most important threats, those that are there to harm us most immediately, which, ha which has changed um, since the emergence of ISIL. And then also to talk about collaboration, how we use what we do in the FBI, what we do in the U.S. intelligence community with our foreign partners and bring that to the private sector. And as I have walked around the halls here um, at the resort and I've, I've bumped into many former law enforcement and U.S. intelligence community partners and it's, it's no coincidence that uh, having discussions with them, whether they've been in the private sector now for maybe only a few months or a few years, I get similar expressions of a feeling of being displaced. And I think that what I'm used to seeing is people can't wait to get out, they do their years of service and they, they wanna move on to the next thing and um, they feel that, that uneasy feeling. It's not that they're feeling that uneasy feeling of not having a guaranteed paycheck, but I can understand that. Uh, the government does provide that. But rather they feel displaced from the intelligence community from what we call our daily news, our daily newspaper. We come to work every day and at our fingertips 
Every day, we have what's happened in the U.S. and what's happened off the shores of the United States from all the partners throughout the U.S. intelligence community, and that's what we use to supplement what's being produced by the financial institutions represented here today. And that's where we have that advantage. We're able to take sus suspicious activity and relate that to U.S. intelligence community reporting and vice versa. Take U.S. intelligence community reporting that our investigators that are chasing the bomb throwers and the operatives, operators, and maybe not looking at the angle that, hey, what can the finances tell me about my threat? And so what I've, what I've come to relate that to is some of my partners telling me that, you know, Jeff, it feels like at my financial institution, I'm, I'm in a room feeling around where all the intelligence is, but I, but I don't know where it is. And so the, what I have said is that, you know, think of, think of TFOS as that pen light, and we send you into that room and where we cooperate and where we share declassified selectors, whether it's a SAR you've already produced or it's something that we have that we want to give the in private sector, that's that pen light. We're sending you into the room, find that piece of intelligence, and then we'll go from there. It could be a subpoena. It could just be something proactive leaning forward to, to pr provide that so that you can get the ball started, even when it's not being required through a subpoena. So where did TFOS come from? So this is not the first time that TFOS has been represented. In fact, Dennis Lormel um, is a great partner and remains such for TFOS. And as you may know, those of you that don't, after 9-11, a special team was put together from the financial crimes section in the criminal investigative division to work expressly on the, the financial components to see what threads could be pulled. And in essence, it was a financial autopsy to identify the flow of funds that were being used by operators, facilitators, and also the financiers. The results were so profound that after the investigation was substantially complete, TFOS became a permanent fixture with not only within the FBI's counterterrorism division, but also starting to become a leader throughout the USIC and with our foreign partners. Among the many methods the terrorists used to conceal their planning, training, and communications was the flow of funds were one aspect that they were unable to completely conceal. In fact, the finances arguably answered more of the five W's than any other single investigative technique. One of the W's that still gives us, a, not just in TFOS, but across the counterterrorism division, our, our greatest challenge is, is the why. And the why is the key to proving material support for terrorism to get us that maximum charge. Um, it still remains the, our greatest challenge. Even though the AQ and the ISIS threat are so different, you know, one is centralized, one is decentralized, one was outside the financial institution system, one likes to use it because it's reliability, um, it's uh, effectiveness, and really, that's instant gratification because these, these plots are so dynamic. You know, we, we call it the distance between the flash to bang is almost instantaneous, whereas with AQ, we had, it was more of a, a financial enterprise investigation that we had been employing against you know, uh, cartels and mobs for generations, white collar uh, criminals. And so, you know, despite the many advanced investigative techniques that we have today, the ability to prove intent really, if you think about it, is what separates a financial, a terrorism financing charge really from an unlicensed money remitting charge. You know, we'll charge anything that we can get, 1,001, you know, lying to the FBI. There's even a, in a CT investigation, we have the ability to, to charge 1,001, which typically comes with about one year sentencing and, and bump it up to eight years if we substantially believe that it was impeding a, a counterterrorism investigation knowingly. But we call any charge that, that is not a CT, a counterterrorism charge, we call that an off-ramping. So well, our job right now is because we believe that flash to bang is so short, our job is to get them off the street immediately. 
If we can leverage some sort of a charge, whether it be a white collar charge or a criminal charge of a you know, violent crime charge, whatever else it is, that gives us the ability to pull on those threads a little bit harder, to do our network targeting, to spin off the investigation, take us where else there's a, there's a network, where there's an individual, a node, or the entire network, whether it be in the United States or off the shores of the United States. The key element to proving intent really is to start our investigations based on intelligence. We are a law enforcement and also primarily an intelligence collection agencies. So as we've gotten better with, with our outreach to the financial sector, what we've talked about is, hey, let's, let's get away from the haystacks. Let's, let's, let's get away from, hey, there's a, there's a car dealership, there's a charity, there's a check cashing. Hey, these guys are moving cigarettes. Let's, there's gotta be, it's gotta be terrorism. That, that money's leaving the United States. Hey, look, you know, rather than point us to a haystack, what we need to do is we need to work cooperatively and work on individuals. We need to turn one needle in that investigation into, not a, you know, into a pile of needles. And we're not gonna be able to do that unless we start with robust intelligence and supplement that back and forth, like I mentioned. Take the typologies that you're using and infuse that with US intelligence community reporting. And also, to take US intelligence community reporting and call our partners on the phone and say, hey, I think we have something here. We'd like to get together with you and provide you some, maybe some, you know, not really a subpoena, but because we don't have an investigation yet. We can't do that, but we want to provide you, let's, let's have a conversation. And that's when we have the ability to actually have U.S. intelligence community created SARS. We, we do that after, after bombings all the time. You know, uh, many financial institutions have the ability to automatically or automated, do automated scrapes of the news, social media, as soon as the name comes out of who conducted an attack, who was involved, they're searching their holdings, and then those SARS are being produced. We get a heads up, we work with FinCEN, get those automatically brought over as expeditiously as possible, and we turn that into operationalized intelligence. The way that TFOS does our investigation today is, is a blend of over 16 years of, of experience, of best practices and lessons learned. So think about it this way. All the investigations that are done by big counterterrorism division at FBI, those are our, our operators and our bomb throwers. Every one of those investigations has a TFOS analyst, agent, forensic accountant working immediately to get the financials started. There's a parallel investigation that, it, that starts. That's for intelligence purposes and also, again, for off-ramping. What we're trying to do is determine whether or not there's anything that we can exploit from the financials. If nothing else, who are they working with domestically and internationally? Those are the same folks that, if during a proactive investigation, Something happens, we, we couldn't stop the attack, and we're not, I don't think that we're gonna be able to anytime, stu anytime soon. They're the same ones that surge, that team surges after an attack to collect financial intelligence in partnership with the financial industry. Another type of investigation that we do is the investigations that are wholly owned by TFAS. Those are the financial investigations of the financiers. Those are the individuals, the nodes, the networks that exist domestically and also internationally. Those, we do a blend of trying to approve the intent for a 2339 charge. We enhance those investigations with advanced and sophisticated techniques. Those must be declassified in order to charge those individuals, those networks. And if we're not able to do so, our intent is to either in, with in-house or bring in the financial crime section from criminal investigative division and cooperate to levy some sort of a bank fraud, money laundering charge, which are quite effective. And, and we've actually superseded some of those charges where the investigation continued. We were able to prove the 2339 material support charge. So, so where are we now? Um, so since the emergence of ISIS, 
In 2016, uh, TFOS began a third component, a third type of uh, investigation that we call targeting. And what that is, and is exactly what I discussed just a, a few minutes ago, it's starting with U.S. intelligence community reporting, starting with derogatory information, and just like we have another section, is called the counterterrorism internet operations section. I mean, those, those are the folks, that, as you can imagine, that, which are doing the investigations into those that are facilitating um, terrorism nodes and networks, and also radicalizing through propaganda on the internet. Um, and so what our, our targeting efforts are doing is taking a look at the reporting and seeing where we might be able to identify in 2015 and 16, we were identifying the flows of foreign fighters. We were identifying the networks that were helping to get them eastward into Turkey and then into Syria. We did a very good job with our USIC partners, our foreign partners, and, uh, and DOD actually conducted many of their disruptions based on financial intelligence in 2016 and, and continuing so. You can, you can look at that can look that up quite readily on the internet. And so that became so effective where we were identifying the point-to-point -point transactions of those that were, the same people that were moving materials and money were also moving men getting into Syria to, who they want to become fully radicalized, trained, and then their goal was to get out and conduct external operations throughout Europe, as you've seen, and of course, also back with the United States. Those efforts were so effective that we began to see those networks break up and use cutouts, shells, pass-throughs, and the game became a little bit more complex. We started to see those that used to be moving the money now watching the money. Um, those that were a party to the transaction, but not in the transaction. And so, um, as I mentioned before, with the AQ threat being more centralized and directed, the ISIS threat became more, much more decentralized and it was stay where you are, radicalize where you are, and conduct attacks where you are. Which brings us to the, the, the current threat model is I, our assistant director has asked us to prioritize a lot of what we do now, focusing inward in the homeland. And, I, and at the in the middle part of 2017 is where we started to really find the sweet spot with the cooperation with the private sector. The, the HVE model is, is one where the people are here within the United States, they don't, they don't intend to travel, they might aspire to travel, it might be part of the radicalization, but what they really want to do is they want, to, they want help with target selection, um, they need something to, to inspire them to um, mobilize, mobilize to violence. And it could be very quick. And the, and the inherent nature of a homegrown violent extremist is that they're very introverted. There's very little intelligence out there. It's very hard for, to collect human intelligence if we've never met the person and the person's really not seeking to meet anybody. It's very hard if they're on the, on the dark web, radicalizing, going offline, you know, the going dark situation is, is a big problem for the United States intelligence community. But one of the things that is out there in the clear are the finances. Not only where they have their money, but where they're spending their money as well. And so with the help of the financial industry, the FBI's counterterrorism division has been, in, has been introduced to other partners in the private sector that are willing to join the fight. You know, um, this room is full of a lot of patriots, and I think that if we were to take away the Bank Secrecy Act requirements, I don't think it would change anything. Because we, we all understand that the common threat, it's not just a matter of if, but when. It's gonna be getting closer and closer to home. In fact, some of you may have actually um, have no people, or maybe family members that have been involved, impacted by an attack. But the retail industry, outside the financial industry, they're not compelled to you know, see something, say something, you know, to know their customer. 
So we're doing as much we can now to blend all the elements of what we call the procurement cycle. Everything that somebody needs to raise, store, spend their money, obtain equipment to conduct an attack. Unfortunately, it could be as simple as going to a retail store and obtaining a knife and then just going to another retail store and getting a rental truck and taking it to the street um, impulsively. But there is information out there. There are opportunities for us to illuminate suspicious activity that we can operationalize in the U.S. intelligence community. Our foreign partners are doing the same as well. They're looking to the FBI. They're looking at the, the models that we've been using, um, most notably in 2016 with our proactive network targeting. And in 2017, we've really, we've really turned it up with private sector outreach. You know, Dennis really started the whole thing and our cooperation, our outreach could could have actually taken place in the conference room. Well, it actually did take place in a conference room around a table. These days, the room is about the half the size of this room. Um, events like this, we have, we have other conferences that are hosted outside the FBI where we bring the venue as well and we explain and we try to help our partners not become unwitting enablers to terrorism. There's a, there's a quote that's written inside the FBI courtyard um, that, was, uh, that was coined by J. Edgar Hoover. It says, the most effective weapon against crime is cooperation. The efforts of all law enforcement with the support and understanding of the American people. I don't know what year that was coined, but it still resonates today. It says in there, with the support and understanding of the American people, that's, that's who you are today, no matter if you were in the U.S. government um, before you began this next career, next chapter in your life, or if you were in the private sector the whole period. Former Director Comey challenged FBI employees to share information with partners and the public up to the point where you begin to feel uncomfortable. That's where we need to stay. I need to find out where that point is so that I don't lose my clearance and ruin uh, 19 years of a good thing going before it's over. But that's what I'm carrying right now. That's the responsibility that I own. I own the responsibility of leading terrorist financing operations for the FBI domestically and internationally. I'm proud to say uh, that the FBI is a world leader in openly collabor collaborating with not only U.S. and foreign law enforcement intelligence partners, but also across the spectrum of the private sector. Now, just recently, Director Ray identified the counterterrorism division in the FBI as doing the very best within the agency, and specifically identified the terrorist financing operations section as the best among the best. And as a complement to that, our foreign partners have been standing up their own terrorist financing operations section over the past several years. Uh, a couple of them, most recently, uh, we've been working with to close the gaps between our private sector outreach, where our foreign partners need the information that we have and we need the private sector information that they have. And I think it was very fitting that before I took the podium today that there was a discussion on 314 and correspondent banking and thresholds. I was wondering whether or not I really wanted to take the podium depending on how that conversation was going to pan out. But I'm telling you right now that it's never been more important for that reporting, for that collaboration, for us, the government, to actually share back and help you turn typologies into intelligence to produce more meaningful results in that suspicious activity. Financial intelligence is cumulative. The products that you're producing today may not be used tomorrow or next week, but in the years to come, it's, it's going to pay off, especially if we're infusing each other's efforts. And so um, I'm glad to be here today to give you confidence and thank you all. I can only write so many thank you letters, um, but they really are meant from the heart. And some of the things that we've done recently 
you've been a huge part of, and I think it's going to pay off dramatically uh, in the future with being proactive, predictive, so that we can be preventative with our approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, um, that was great. And, and I think that uh, people in this audience love to hear uh, about the importance of the work they do, that sometimes uh, you know, they can feel a little lonely and overlooked that they're uh, gathering that information and finding those stars that it has a real impact. And I wondered if you could talk maybe just a little more granularly about some of the public-private things that you do and if there's some tangible uh, kind of encouraging results that come out of that that you can, you can mention. Wow, the hot light just turned on. Yes, yeah, that's what we okay. want to do. We're sweating you out on this one. We're... I thought only we did that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the most, the, the easiest way for me to relate in a granular fashion how the outreach pays off and pays dividends is just to relate back to where we came from. You know, um, during a period of heightened threat, certainly after an attack occurred, um, we probably had phones back then that had the buttons and we were, we, you know, the, or the dial or whatever. Um, we, were, we were feverishly dialing up the banks, trying to let them know, hey, this, this attack occurred. What do you have for us, if anything? And so today, it's, it's a combination of that. So the first thing we're doing is we're starting with the, with the credit reports. We're getting back to find out what that financial footprint looks like. In the process, the, the information is coming in from those that are able to automatically scrape social media and say, hey, you know, we need a, we need a grand jury subpoena. We've got information for you. Others, we're providing the information because we know that they have an account holder that's, that's been involved. That information is, is, is becoming almost like a uh, one hop to another. In fact, I was in the lobby speaking to one of, one of our partners. And, and just, just after uh, a, a recent attack, we were able to identify selectors with one financial institution. That financial institution provided us results. And, and in those results led us to another financial institution that we didn't realize that person had a connection to. Can't get into how, but we, de we then did pursue that financial institution and found out that there was a storage facility that the person had an active account on. Within, within an hour, that FBI field office had a search warrant for that storage facility, which was being used in furtherance of that, of that, that event. And so it, it's, it's that quick. Whether we're getting those tangible results right after a, an attack occurs, or we're using the, the information to either pass it to a foreign partner to let them know, hey, we need, we need to look into this, potentially this, this company um, that might be advancing procurement and facilitating terrorist um, procurement. And that's, that's where I, I became very interested also before this block began on that correspondent bank relationship, which we've also been, been keenly focused on uh, to help us defeat terrorists and, and mitigate threats off the shores of the United States. So um, is there a place yet where that can go, that kind of public-private partnership? Do you have some thoughts about greater expansion, greater efforts, or are you at a place where you want to be? Oh, we're never at the place where we want to be. Uh, Rick Small hit it on the head. I mean, if, if there is some way that we can have the information um, immediately, I, I don't want all the information. There's, you know, again, there's only so many of us that are, that are working this threat. But I think having the, having the real-time dialogue, you know, being able to give the community typologies that we think work, Having those relationships at a higher level, whereas those that are directing the creation of those SARS, directing, driving their teams that have prior law enforcement, 
prior U.S. intelligence community experience, they're still, I mean, we've, we've got private sector partners that have units now that are called terrorist financing units, mm -hmm. you know, within the enterprise. Um, you know, thankfully, day in and day out, we're not identifying terrorist financiers, but there is a gap that exists that I'm concerned about between criminal money laundering operations and straight terrorist financing operations. You know, there, there are only a few ways that you can raise money and move money. And on the surface, it looks, some of it looks very much the same, you know, especially when you're talking about uh, homegrown violent extremist. You know, that person doesn't have a network that is sending the money from outside the United States into the United States to help that person conduct an attack. And really, the attacks are so different now, they're, they're not like the sophisticated attacks that occurred while we were fighting Al-Qaeda in the United States. These are more simplistic. It doesn't take a whole lot to conduct that. But they are, they're, they're finding ways to send money for the fight, and they're also find, finding ways to procure items that are very cost effective um, and, and effective to conduct attacks. Well, I mean, you're talking, aren't you, about groups that may be involved in drug trafficking on, on the one hand, or individuals who may have a student loan uh, that they take out that does not end up at all paying for school. Right, so, you know, we, now the, the drug trafficking part, um, I'm not gonna say that that's something where, where we see that, we don't see that right now. I mean, it, at least for mm -hmm. us, for, you know, for the ISIS, for the HVE threat. And certainly, and certainly not domestically as much, yeah. Right, but we have, especially in 2015 and 2016, and I'm sure as you've read the cases that have been adjudicated, where people were abusing the financial system, abusing school loans, whatever they could, to get out of the United States to fund a trip to get overseas, to radicalize, to be trained, and then come back to the United States, yes. Any way that they can raise money, um, bust out schemes um, as well, right? If you, if you believe that you're not going to come back, you're not really worried about your credit. Um, if you believe that you're just gonna, you're gonna go over and you're going to marry a fighter, um, you're, not going to, you're not gonna worry much about re repaying your loans. Right. Um, that's, those, that's the criminal activity that I see, whether it be taking, taking out loans, or conducting, you know, kiting, um, fraud, anything that they can to, to, to raise a little bit of money just, just to, to achieve the mission. And, you know, I think um, we've talked a little bit, there's a couple of places I want to go here in questions, but uh, we've talked a little bit on the phone about people obviously really like typologies. Are there typologies or are there alerts for when that student loan is, is really going to be used to fund someone's travel abroad or someone's buying a, you know, renting a van and, and doing something awful? Uh, you know, what, what, what could fan financial institutions know about that that would be helpful? Well, certainly the typologies that I, I know that the folks are using um, are still the most effective where if travel is being booked, if money is being sent to territories, obviously if you're seeing you know, them, someone traveling straight to Turkey, um, other uh, travel, they're trying to obscure where they're really going, so they may book through and just never make the connecting flight. It's whatever, whatever third country it is that they're, they're booking for. Um, as, as far as procurement, we do have um, typologies, we are helping private sector partners develop algorithms where those algorithms already exist to protect that company from losing money, mm -hmm. whether it be a bank, whether it be a retailer, whether it be a shipping company, whatever it is. Um, so we're having those dialogues. What we're doing is we're using lessons learned, best practices, and we're taking leaders from within the industry and helping really to level set across the industry things that are being dual purposed. And I think that's the most important thing. You know, whether, whether a private sector partner is using it to protect their customers' PII, whether they're trying to keep money into the enterprise itself, um, or if they're trying to root out 
um, physical crime, uh, maybe there might be a, a network that they might be afraid that is, are exploiting stores in a, in a common geographic radius. You know, those are all the conversations that leave space for the U.S. intelligence community to provide them some typologies that they'll be able to use. There are a lot of relationships through the banks that um, with, with the retail sector as well because the, the retail partners are using cards that are, that are held by the financial institutions that, that are represented here today. And those are the encouraging conversations that we need. Again, right, because the, the private sector outside the financial industry are not compelled to see something, say something, know their customers, so on and so forth. But they don't want to have the associated risk. Bank A that has a card with retailer A does not want to be somewhat associated with not doing their due diligence and not mutually knowing their customer. I think that's a really forward-leaning step when it comes to cooperation because Bank A could really sit back and say, look, that point of sale happened at a retailer. Yeah, it's using our card, but you know, we don't have the ability to know who walks up to the counter at a supply store and makes a purchase. What we're doing is we're, we're changing that. We're changing that conversation. And, it's, and it's, been very, it's been very effective for us because the retailers previously were not really understanding what we were trying to do. You know, our old campaigns were, used to be the Shoe Leather Express. We would go out and we would go to pawn shops, we would go to gun ranges, and we would go to feed supply and give pamphlets and say these are the things that we're, that we're really concerned about. Now what we're doing is we're, we're, we're shaping that behavior, not only at the, at the storefront level, but also at the executive level as well, based on the partnerships that occur, that exist um, because of those relationships between the, the banks and, and the retailers. Oh, that's very interesting. And, uh, and I guess that sort of advances being able to anticipate uh, an attack rather than just respond to it. Um, and I think that there's been a, that for a long time, the truism was sort of that we're still trying to find ways to anticipate attacks but that we're very good at, you guys are very good at, uh, not me personally, but you guys, uh, at um, collecting uh, financial information from everybody here and after an attack, really finding the associates, the paths and whatever. And, I, and we were talking before you came on, you mentioned something about like the, 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 there's a tremendous pull in a lot of places uh, for your attention, including overseas, and, and I bring, I'm connecting these two things, sure. that we know that in Brussels and other places, the FBI was particularly helpful in coming up with working with financial institutions patterns for, uh, for the, who the terrorists were and everything, and maybe you could talk a little about that and the importance of those international partnerships. Yeah, so the, no matter whether an attack is against the United States or um, within the United States or against the, an interest uh, abroad. Um, uh, an FBI investigation may not be open if there is no impact to a U.S. interest, but that doesn't stop our efforts to take that reporting and look to see whether or not we might be able to find something that's already within our holdings or something that we may be able to pull out, like I mentioned before, by having a suspicious activity report produced and then take a look at that information and see whether or not we're able to build out with other reporting that may already exist uh, throughout the U.S. intelligence community. So, for example, it, there might be a, um, a network that exists in Europe to, to produce fraudulent passports to help move fighters um, uh, back and forth to, con to conduct internal and external operations. If there's a piece within that newly created financial intelligence, that SAR, that we're able to pass to one of our foreign partners, that's going to help them do their own network targeting. Um, we have a very lucky relationship with some of the other U.S. Uh, intelligence community partners where they're collecting a, a lot of information uh, to include financial information that we're able to, to leverage on behalf of our foreign partners. And we're able to to, con to conduct that network targeting piece that may eventually lead to a piece of reporting that identifies a threat against the United States. So at that point, we would open up an investigation and run parallel again, our interests against the, the, those that were uh, conducting the attack, whether it be in Brussels or whether it be in the UK 
Germany, wherever else, and advance their investigation. Um, and that's, that's how we identify what our proactive network targeting is. We don't want to work reactively. A lot of our work is reactive, but um, our practice right now, I would say, is, is about 33% um, proactive targeting, and that, in, that involves our foreign partners. Um, domestically, I know domestic is a huge part of the focus, and you know, we are seeing single individuals that do great damage. Um, with that in mind, and then kind of alerting people, are there new players that you're seeing come into this, you know, different types of people who are funding or whatever that are kind of a clue? I mean, uh, I think we've had an idea of, um, you know, remittances from work and everything, somehow funding overseas terrorism, we're ending up here, but, but is there a more complicated picture of who's funding, who's potentially funding terrorism? Now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still believe that, that um, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the charities and the, and the car dealers, and you know, there's, a, there's a lot of focus on those check cashing companies that illicit money is, is flowing out of those practices. But really, it, it, unless we're able to focus on the receiving end of that transaction and connect U.S. reporting or connect foreign reporting that who might be receiving that money, that's where we don't have the ability to prove the intent. I'm not saying that there's, there's no commingling. I'm not saying, you know, you know but the, the folks that are, that are remitting money through charities, they're doing that through obligation. They're doing it to send money to their families. We don't know whether or not that money is being passed on with the knowledge of those that are, that are you know, donating it here in the United States. I think what we're, what we're most concerned about are those that are the center for um, collecting money for the Mujahideen and sending it over and infusing those investigations with sophisticated and advanced techniques where we might be able to prove the intent. In fact, we, we just had a, a case that was adjudicated last year, um, 15 women that were sending money to um, al-Shabaab. You know, the, really the linchpin for that investigation was the advanced and sophisticated techniques where we were able to, to declassify those, those conversations to prove that intent. Otherwise, what it really looks like is it looks like unlicensed money remitting. Um, we still drive against those. We still try to find whether or not there is something that we could, a criminal charge that we can off ramp. But I would say right now that you know, propaganda really is uh, a problem for, for us. Um, encouraging people to send money. You know, those, the, the money that they're sending are small amounts. They're sending it through money service businesses. They might be sending it through virtual currency. They might, they might be giving it to somebody else on, you know, that they might be using their bank account. But it, it is really all source intelligence that's being used to shape those investigations. But I think that the, the main piece is a lot of those investigations are starting outside of the terrorist financing operations section. We're a force multiplier for other, for investigations that involve other suspicious activity, mm -hmm. other suspicious reporting, not just about finances, where we're, we're lending that financial investigative piece to see, okay, this person has radicalized behavior that's been demonstrated and reported, somewhat corroborated. Um, we don't know whether they're going to do anything or not, hey, let's take a look at the finances and see whether or not they're sending money mm. or whether they're spending money to procure. That's where the terrorist financing operations section merges really well with the larger um, counterterrorism division. Uh, I've got a couple of questions from the audience, and I know some of these you may or may not be ready for, so you can always claim uh, sure. national security uh, All right. uh, preference. Um, what are the top one or two transaction monitoring routines or alerts financial institutions should implement uh, to identify terrorist activity or networks? Well, I wish it was a, a multiple choice test to see what kind they're, they're, so you, they're yeah, implementing, you, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but I, I think that really the, the piece that we've really been focusing on lately has been the correspondent relationships. Um, because we're, we're, we are very much concerned with 
the um, external operations that are, that are leaving Syria, especially after the fall of Raqqa, you know, ISIS is reconstituting, they're setting up um, remote provinces or at least nodes in other places in the world, but yet they're still procuring materials to uh, train, uh, equip, and conduct attacks. And so, you know, the, the transactions that, are, that may look like money laundering front company operations are probably really the most prevalent um, outside the United States for, for us to maybe, you know, see the U.S. transactions and then also to take the U.S. intelligence community reporting. So we'll see that SAR, mm -hmm. and then we'll look for other intelligence that might say that, hey, we've got other transactions that either in the region or specifically with a company, and try to pull on that thread to see whether or not that is uh, procurement. Um, otherwise, we're starting on the other side of the, of the equation. We're starting with the U.S. reporting that might involve a front company near Syria um, that might be procuring materials on behalf of ISIS from, from a third country. And that's really where the, the bulk of our most substantive conversations have occurred and some very significant progress has been made um, to not only for us to have our foreign partners help us with investigations, but also have the financial institution, you know, the financial sector make decisions about how well the correspondent banks know their customers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and see if we can squeeze out of that some intelligence for us to enhance our investigations. So I don't know if, you know, the, the, sim, the more simplistic SARS, uh, you know, the travel, the, the money leaving the United States, going into the conflict zones or near the conflict zones, that all still remains the same. But I think empirically, the work that we're doing right now to, to looking for foreign type procurement is the typology that I would, I would like to see 2018, 2019 for, for TFOS really mature. And kind of uh, drilling down a little bit on that, I, I think we've sort of talked about this. So uh, SARS that are useful are SARS that have that kind of information about the destination of funds. And, and I mean, what's a good SAR? What's a bad SAR from your point of view? Well, I mean, there are, there are no bad SARS. Are. Like I mentioned before, I mean. For, Only confused SARS or something. Well, I mean, if, you know, like I said, if it's, if it's not a SAR that's going to be used tomorrow, who's to say that it can't be used in the future? Who's to say that a, a weaker SAR or a more vague SAR is not going to be somebody that winds up tangentially connected to somebody that we know um, has significant more SARS against them? I mean, that. You know, we potentially could initiate a SAR that winds up bumping into a SAR that has been sitting waiting for that connection to be illuminated. Um, and especially if it's domestic. I mean, we can't risk anything for not identifying a potential network in the United States. Not to say that if it's off our shore, it's somebody else's problem, but, you know, those that can't leave the United States are bound and determined to conduct an attack, contribute to the fight one way or the other. You know, we have folks that are within the United States that can't get out because they're no fly And we call those frustrated travelers. Um, that, that is a problem for us. Um, we actually have a problem with those, you know, um, U.S. persons that are disrupted overseas coming back to the United States that we don't have full charges against right? Mm -hmm. So their financial footprint, their financial activity, if that winds up in a SAR one way or another, that's something that, that we may eventually use. Um, well, that's good. Um, another question was, uh, I, I think goes to, I'm sorry, I've kind of lost my track here. We did have a question about the Caribbean. Do you want to say anything about uh, uh, I don't know if shell companies come into this and that kind of thing. Any, anything you can say about counter-terrorist activity or terror activity in Trinidad, Tobago is mentioned here, anything? Um, I would say that uh, following the fall of Raqqa uh, with those that are being displaced, um, there are significant um, threats, especially to our partners that may not have 
um, advanced terrorist financing, uh, ad advanced anti-money laundering, um, you know, practices, laws, and that, that is something that we are concerned about. You know, we have over uh, 80 locations internationally where we have attaches. You know, our group does a very robust job of pushing intelligence as best we can to our foreign partners. And um, I would say that, yes, the, that area, um, areas throughout Asia, um, it, it's only a matter of time before we start to see that cumulative effect of, of, of where remote satellite type operations mm -hmm. are, are going to be um, concerning. Um, because if, it, if that type of activity was occurring where some of our better equipped partners um, are ready for that, I think we would do a very, a very good job mitigating that threat. But it's our job to bring capacity to our foreign partners, Trinidad, Tobago, um, other parts of, of Asia as well. In fact, we do that. We, we spend a significant amount of time going out and conducting uh, training for FIUs, for law enforcement, intelligence services. We've, we do TFOS 101s. We do 200 level type training for our foreign partners as well. We attend FATF. And so, um, yes. I would say that, um, especially given the, given the thresholds where it doesn't take a whole lot of money to, um, to conduct substantial procurement. Right. Um, it only takes about 750 bucks or so to sustain a foreign fighter for a month in, in Syria. So every, every, piece of, every piece of the uh, equation counts significantly. Somebody also asked about, you, you mentioned car dealerships. If there's anything more you can say about typologies associated with car dealerships. I mean, I think we've all had bad experiences with car dealers, but that doesn't right. necessarily mean. Yeah, we're, that, that's a haystack for us. We, we would rather get a, a, a SAR that involves an individual, and if that individual winds up being associated with one of the stereotypical haystack type businesses, we're not going to discount that. Um, if, if all roads lead us to a second needle, a third needle, whether they're domestic or they're international, we'll follow up on it. And in fact, arguably, that might, because it's one of those stereotypical um, criminal enterprises, we might be able to at least affect a criminal disruption, but it's not something that we, that we say, ah, it must, be, it must be in there somewhere. We're going to waste our bandwidth applying um, our, our, our resources towards that. Uh, final question, you'll be glad to know. Uh, we're, we're, uh, a question about how much should we be concerned about cryptocurrencies and then the more mainstream fintech products, how much are they being exploited and are there any things that people from financial institutions should know about seeing those kinds of transactions, some of which go through their institutions and some of which don't? Right. Well, I mean, it's, you know, Virtual currency, cryptocurrency, is a, it's a reality. It exists. Um, we, we look for it, whether it be in suspicious reporting, um, whether it be uh, pursuant to a search warrant. You know, we're training our investigators to, to look at mobile devices, to look at uh, computers. Um, I think it's, it's inevitable that it's, it's going to show up in the repertoire of somebody that's into a lot of stuff, especially if, if, they're, if they're remitting a lot of money through the MSBs, I would not be surprised. We're not surprised when we see virtual currency. Um, I'm more concerned right now is do we have the, you know, the tripwires in place? Do we have the regulations? Do we have the tools within the, the FBI, the, the, the US intelligence community to help us decipher those transactions? I, we, we don't think at this point that it's anything more than really just a, a parallel currency system that's an option. It, it is becoming more mainstream, mm -hmm. but uh, I would say that I'm more concerned with those that are operating in the dark space than I am virtual currency. Um, I think that there are, there's nefarious activity that goes along in, in the dark web, and those people believe that there's, a, there's an added layer of comfort with the virtual currency. I, you know, I'll leave it up to our cyber experts to talk about the problems of virtual currency, but as far as splitting transactions and, and causing the investigators to run 
uh, in circles and, and delaying you know, being able to find where the money comes out, that's where I find virtual currency to be more problematic. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we have seen it. Um, and I think it's, like I said, it's becoming, it's becoming more mainstream now. You know, the financial institutions want have to have a piece of that, whether, whether they have a card that facilitates those transactions, but we're not seeing expressed reporting that says, you know, conduct your, you know, transactions through virtual currency. Please join me in thanking Jeff Cannon.